Good morning, I'm Susan Wente, Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Vanderbilt University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this installment of the 2020 Engine for Art, Democracy and Justice program. This exciting program and platform is elevating visual representation as a means of exploring inclusivity, creativity, and the ways we're all connecting with one another. The theme for this year's programming is Living in Common in the Precarious South. The Engine for Art, Democracy, and Justice Initiative will explore this theme through dynamic conversations with artists, curators, scholars, and other members of the community. This topic is especially important in our current moment, given our societal reckoning with injustice and the enduring challenges brought forth by the global pandemic. Before we begin, I want to sincerely thank Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair and Professor of Art, for her visionary leadership in the creation of this program. She's worked on this idea for many years and continues to bring it to life. I'd also like to acknowledge Vanderbilt's partners for the fall programming, including Bisque University, the Frist Art Museum, and the Millions of Conversations campaign. At Vanderbilt and beyond, we've all witnessed the power of art to open paths for honest conversations, learning new perspectives, and reconciling differences. I'm proud of the cross-disciplinary engagement between many scholars at Vanderbilt and around the world with this program. And I wanna thank you for your engagement and for being here today. Good morning to everyone and good afternoon, perhaps, for one of you that are in different time zone and maybe good evening as well. Uh, it is my privilege and pleasure to be here with you in this occasion and I'm going to say in this auspicious Wednesday, uh, September the 23rd, 2020. Uh, I have few things to mention to you in a small introduction. And I'm going to start with gratitude. I am grateful to every one of you joining us today, um, whatever you are. And I am grateful to every one of the panelists today with us here. And I am grateful to the ancestors who allowed us all to be together here. And I am grateful to the people who inhabit this land before us, which energy sustain and keep us going. It's because they sacrificed in the history that EADJ needed to exist. I want to talk to you about breathing. EADJ, the engine for art, democracy, and justice, is a platform to bring people together to discuss, to think, to dream, and to fight. I want to propose a fight for the right to breathe. It takes us, many people, those lucky ones that get to longevity, more than 600 million breaths in the time of a life. And it takes 
eight minutes and 45 seconds to take away the right of somebody to breathe. Because I cannot accept with moral center such possibilities, I decide that EADJ was needed. I want to remind that when we come to life, it takes one breath to acknowledge our presence, and it takes one breath to get out of it. It is a precious human right, our option and possibility of breath with freedom is a fundamental human right of gathering. To gather is to bring ideas together, people together, but also in the root of the word gathering, the word good is there too. So I am very privileged and proud that the engine for our democracy and justice is a gathering of thinkers, makers, dreamers, and fighters. This is not only a gathering of the artists and the scholar. This is a gathering with you, the people that are listening to us, your family members from what you're going to be talking after this, and any other person that we will try to bring together in this fight for goodness. I want to talk about building because EADJ is just a, a structure of brick by brick, grain or sand by grain, to a structure buildings and to a structure beach. It's a place in which by one ish of our little dreams and determination together, we may actually start tracing the path that we want to do and the site and the final place that we want to get. I am an immigrant, a black woman, a descendant of slaves, a descendant of Chinese, a descendant of Spaniards. I am an immigrant from a place very close by to America, Cuba. Remember that scene that say, be good to your neighbor? Well, I want to use this place to say, let's build better bridges to our neighbors. Let's expand the conversation of reconciliation, of truth, and to engage each other in the better things and the better best of us, us all. I want to build a little path to a fundamental other idea. After being raised and grow in socialism and matured in capitalism, I could declare to you today in the launching of the second part of the engine for our democracy and justice, that I truly believe there is only one ideology worth to fight for. And that ideology is love. So I want to anchor the effort of this engine in a discourse, an investigation, an inquiry, and an expansion of what is love. As a mother of a brown child, love for me is to have the peace of mind that he could go to the street and come back home, that he could run a few blocks around his neighbor and come back home. Does he want to sell a few cigars to be fun, he could be back home. That as, a, as an aunt of a few girls, that if they are sleeping in their dorm or in their home, they will be awake the next morning. So, because I know that art is centering in love and truth, is that I call this project Engine for Art, Democracy, and Justice. I believe that in the role, in the potential, in the capacity of arts and artists and art lovers to anchor themselves in the truth that is pertinent to love, we will have the possibility to move forward with a better food. 
enough of vitriol of race and class, enough of vitriol of origin and place. In this idea of the common and precarious house, there are many new lessons to learn and there are many new knowledge to access. So I invite you all to open with us here a conversation and a learning process. EADJ is not only a set of conversation, it's also a curriculum, it's also a class. They are a student sitting in the audience today and they are taking notes and they will respond. I want to that the ADJ will be a contaminating virus of love, of center, of beauty, of commitment, of truth that entered your house and stay there. Let's be brave enough an open conversation that we have been hiding from. The brilliant, brilliant uh, James Baldwin taught us many lessons. And one of them is the thing that we know that we don't need to be reminding us that we know and to have the courage to front up and see it. It is my great honor to have with us today every one of the conversions and it's my great honor to invite you to join us to the entire eight episodes of EADJ. I'm going to say one more word of gratitude to Vanderbilt University for allowing a black immigrant Cuban woman come to this ground, come to this geography and spurt to fly her dreams. It is something good to say about that. And it's something extraordinary and courageous from this university to open his door to such possibilities and such proposition. It is my pleasure now to introduce my dear great friend, Marina Fokiris, who I have been loving and hanging with and literally uh, dreaming with for a long time. Marina was the director of the Atenas Kunsthalle, a very important place for innovation and experiment the founder and editor of South Magazine, and one of the curator of Documenta 14 is that there where we met. Marina, please introduce the program. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Uh, big applause. And it's hard to take the microphone after your wise and so sentimental words, but I will continue with uh, some gratitude. Magda, thank you is not enough of a word to show my gratitude for making us part of your vision and giving us the chance to walk together on the challenging and gratifying path that brings us here today. Um, it is my great honor as well um, to be part of the Engine for Our Democracy and Justice family, which is conceived and founded by Magda Campos Pons and refers to her dreams and effort to make this world a better place. For the past months, almost a year now, right? We have been working together with the core team of EADJ, as Magda says, thinking, exchanging, strategizing, shaping the content of the webinar, which is just about to go public now. Sometimes even dreaming and stargazing, hoping for this day to come uh, in flesh, in real life. I'm truly grateful to the members of the team together, all together, and each one of you individually for their huge efforts and for our amazing collaboration. My main gratitude, of course, and above all, goes to all our participating guests, the speakers, the moderators, the respondents, whose knowledge and practice has been informing us for a long time now, long before the time frame of the, this webinar, and that this, their practice has been really shaping and um, somehow influencing us to make a program like that and future endeavors as such. As for what are we going to experience? The thematic focus of the structure and the structure of this program is informed from our, also from our everydayness in these challenging times, from what we all uh, are thinking uh, right now or should be thinking during these difficult patches uh, of our living experience. Difficulties in breathing, as Magda was saying, due to the pandemic and due to murder. At the same time, 
difficulties accepting the injustice towards each other, the injustice towards the human and non-human living beings in this planet, difficulties in imagining a truly democratic space open to uh, multiple viewpoints at the same time, difficulties, 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 they all call for an immediate action. And here we are, addressing living in common in the precarious Souths. Living in common and not common living, as per the very wise distinction that French philosopher Jacques Lupnancy makes, referring to a togetherness that allows not only polyphony, but also reconcile contradictions to coexist with inequality and respect. How can we redefine the way our differences brings us together and celebrate them? As other Lord, American writer and civil rights uh, activist suggests. How can we fight asymmetries and unjustified hierarchies within the so-called metacolonial times? How can we respond to the popularity of the ultra-right authoritarian nationalist governments? How can we form a truly democratic space within the arts and open an unexpected dialogue among neighborhoods, cities, regions, descender geographies and approaches. How to live together is the eternal question. I hope the words that they will be exchanged these eight weeks ahead of us will add to this restorative collective action that now is needed more than ever. It's time to repair our coexistence before it's too late. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the program. Magda. Thank you, Marina. Thank you for those wonderful words. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Kevin Murphy, who will be our moderator today. Professor Murphy is the Andrew W. Mellon Chair of Art History at Vanderbilt. He has been here for seven years now. Previous to his appointment at Vanderbilt, he was the Chair of the Art Department of History PhD program at the University of New York City and he was there for 15 years. And previous to that, he started his career as teaching at the University of Virginia in the architecture department. Uh, when one moves to an university, we, we find always colleagues that becomes your um, sunning board, the people that you go for coffee, for tea, for a meal, for a difficult question, and for a place to share a smile and a good piece of poetry. Uh, in Kevin Murphy, I have found that uh, colleague and that partner here. So it is my great pleasure to have him as moderator of this first episode of Monuments. Thank you very much, Magda, for that uh, introduction. Um, I would uh, like to begin by introducing a little bit our theme today and our, dis our panel of distinguished artists and respondents. My very brief remarks on the topic of monuments are offered as introduction and as a thanks to Professor Compass Pons, who originated the idea of EADG, EADJ, excuse me, and who recently shared with my students and me her ambitions for the project, as well as some <clears throat> inspirational words from James Baldwin in the form of a video of his lecture at the University of California, Berkeley in 1979. Referring to the civil rights movement, Baldwin said in that famous speech that, quote, I am a witness and a survivor of the latest slave rebellion, end quote. In the context of the ongoing debate about monuments, that seemed to me like a telling statement. For in one sense, Baldwin is describing himself as a monument. It is generally accepted that a monument can be <clears throat> deliberately erected to preserve historical memory, or it can be a thing, a building, a place, a work of art that evidences a moment in the past, a person, a group of people, a social or political movement, and so on. 
We are used to thinking of monuments as solid, substantial witnesses to times gone by, whose stability ensures their survival. In his telling, Baldwin plays the role of monument to the civil rights movement. Recently, two sorts of monuments have been in our sights. Those consisting of sculpted figures on bases, having no function other than to represent someone or something, and those buildings with a variety of functions whose very names and historical associations connect them with sometimes controversial figures from the past. To take just two examples, we can think first of the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., a building with a certain amount of interior space, but dedicated exclusively to the representation of an historic figure. Or consider Monticello, the home in the Virginia Hills that Jefferson designed, redesigned, built, and rebuilt over the course of many years. It is a residence, but it's second, in its second iteration, Jefferson topped it with a dome, the, that form known from antiquity to indicate sacred, often public spaces, making Monticello at once a house <clears throat> and a monument to Jefferson's intellectual and political preeminence, a lofty monument that was quite literally undergirded by the institution of slavery. And yet a monument <clears throat> can be much more and less than a building or a sculpture. As Alois Regal wrote in his still influential article, The Modern Cult of Monuments in 1903, while we think of monuments as massive and imposing, even when they are literary works, in fact, as he writes, even a, tor even a torn off slip of paper with a short, unimportant note can be a monument, especially when it is the only record of a particular aspect of the past. In that case, <clears throat> The fag fragmentary note will be what he calls an utterly indispensable monument of art. Regal anticipates when he attributes monumental status to ephemeral things. Carolyn Randall Williams, a participant in our next episode of EADJ, who recently similarly expanded the notion of a monument when she wrote that quote, my body is a monument. My skin is a monument of the Confederacy. Since Charlottesville, Confederate monuments have been central to the ongoing struggle for social justice as their inescapable relationships to a racist past have been ever more repugnant. The search for a progressive and inclusive monument which Randall Williams' comments suggests, takes on particular urgency at this moment of social and political struggle. We are fortunate today to have with us four distinguished figures from the art world who will help us to advance the de debate about the forms through which we will reflect upon our history in a new critical way. We welcome to EADJ this morning Hank Willis Thomas, Carrie Mae Weems, and Monica Shefsing. I will pose a few questions to each of them that I hope will give each the opportunities to speak about the relationship between their practices and the current reconsideration of the monument. That discussion will be followed by a pause <clears throat> and then by a response from critic Ben Davis. Finally, there will be an opportunity for the panelists to address one another and for the audience to ask questions. I'm going now to very briefly introduce the panelists. They all have many accomplishments and I apologize in advance for leaving out the bulk of them, but I don't want to shortchange our discussion. 
On the occasion of the recent retrospective of his work organized by the Portland Art Museum, the curators wrote that, quote, throughout his career, Hank Willis Thomas has addressed the visual systems that perpetuate inequality and bias in bold, skillfully crafted works. Through photographs, sculpture, video, and collaborative public art projects, he invites us to consider the role of popular culture in instituting, uh, uh, in instituting excuse me, discrimination and how art can raise critical awareness of the ongoing struggle for social justice and civil rights. Willis Thomas lives in Brooklyn, but he has exhibited uh, globally both in solo and group exhibitions far too numerous to mention. Born in 1976, he has already received two honorary doctorates. In the New York Times review of her retrospective, Holly Carter wrote, quote, Ms. Carrie Mae Weems is what she has always been, a superb image maker and a moral force, focused and irrepressible. For decades, she has been recognized for her incisive images that interrogate family relationships, cultural identity, sexism, class, political systems, and consequences of power. Currently on view in Nashville are a series of interventions, which we will hear more about, in which she has uh, focused on the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on communities of color. Uh, among her many exhibitions, awards, and fellowships, I say just two. In 2013, she received the MacArthur Genius Grant, as well as the Con Congressional Black Caucuses Foundation uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards. She has received, received as well, numerous honorary doctorate degrees. In May 2019, Monica Schefzig was appointed director of the De Apple Art Center in Amsterdam. And prior to that, she was a writer, editor, and curator based in Berlin and Rotterdam. Schefzig was one of six curators behind the 2017 edition of Documenta. And prior to that, she worked on the international program of the University of Chicago's Reba and David Logan Center for the Arts and held positions at the, excuse me, Witte de Witt Center and Viet Zwart Institute, both of which are based in, the, in Rotterdam. Finally, Ben Davis is an art critic living and working in New York City and the author of 9.5 Theses on Art and Class, published in 2013, and currently National Art Critic for Artnet News. He was the editor of the Elements of Architecture, the catalog to the 2014 Venice Architecture Biennale, and in 2019, Harvard's uh, Neiman Journal Journalism Lab reported he was one of the five most influential art critics in the United States. So with that, I want to turn to Hank Willis Thomas uh, and ask him if he will speak from his uh, the cockpit of his uh, fighter pilot there um, uh, to the issue of monuments and the intersection of that subject with his own. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, how much time do I have? I can't remember. Um, if you wanted to take about five minutes to respond, that would be great. You say 10 or two minutes? <laughs> How about five minutes or so? Okay, five, five minutes. minutes. That works perfectly. Well, it's so great to be here. Um, I didn't know that everyone calls it Bandy. I'm so out of touch. Um, it's an incredible time to be alive. Um, it's an incredible time to be awake. Um, I have been part of a growing collective of people who are uh, part of a continuum called the Wide Awakes, which was founded in 1860 um, organically as, uh, as an emancipation movement, an emancipation party that uh, drafted and elected their uh, candidate, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, 
to be the first president of the Republican Party, which was founded only f six years before um, in 1854. And this, uh, the, the, the gestures of these radical imaginaries uh, who thought that they could in short order change the economy and this and basically the, the, the nature and the spiritual core of the United States um, has been really inspiring. It's inspiring not only because of what they were able to accomplish, but also because of all the work that needs to continue that hasn't that, that isn't done. And um, it's there's it's possible to argue that the, the Civil War only came to an end in 2020 when the monuments uh, to uh, the people who uh, sought insur insurrection in our country are, are only beginning to come down. And um, that is a doozy. It's something that we, um, that if the past 160 years, we, you know, I've been told by Robert D.G. Kelly, professor at UCLA, that, you know, the, the South won, the North won the, the, the war on the battlefield, but the South won the war for the hearts and minds. And that the narrative, um, whether it be from Dukes of Hazard or from uh, all of the ways in which uh, Confederate monuments are, 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 have been monumentalized on Stone Mountain and other places, um, it, it tells a great, another story. And um, a lot of my work over the past several years has really been directly in the legacy of uh, uh, Magda and Karen Mae Weems, who have through their uh, work challenged each and every one of us to reconsider our relationship, not only to our families, but also to public space and to citizenry. Uh, and um, now that I've, I understand um, that public space is like all other space, it's meant to be engaged with, it's meant to be challenged and altered. And what we do in public actually will and can shape our future and our now. And, so um, I, I, I'm really grateful to, to be part of this conversation, but also to be uh, able to listen um, to, to the, the, the maestros who kind of paved the way for so many of us. And what's up, Ben? Nice to see you. Hank, can I um, pursue that just a little bit? Um, I found really leading your comment about um, occupying public space. And before we started, you you mentioned your recent project in Philadelphia. I just wondered whether you could just talk about that a little bit in relation to this idea of um, we, you know, uh, um, reanimating and appropriating public space in the way, particularly in the wake of, you know, many Confederate monuments that you referred to coming down in this final episode of the Civil War. Sure. Well, I just showed. Um, I would have been uh, going to just Google it. Um, I was I was invited as part of an organization or a collaborative called Monument Lab out of uh, Temple University to install uh, a, a new monument, and, and I created a, a nine foot Afropic sculpture that was placed in close proximity to a very uh, notorious uh, sculpture of uh, the, the former mayor and police commissioner, Frank Rizzo. And uh, in May or early June of 2020, after uh, the murder of George Floyd and the, the Great Awakening, um, we, this monument uh, to, to um, Frank Rizzo was removed. I also, was able to make a 25 foot version of it. This is outside of the Africa, Africa Center. It's currently installed outside of the uh, human rights campaign in Washington, DC. And what I am beginning to, um, what I'm most inspired by is not only how my work, but also works like uh, Kehinde, Kehinde Wiley's Rumors of War um, statue, which is installed outside of the, uh, the, the, the MFA in uh, Richmond in Virginia, uh, six months after this was installed, uh, many of the Confederate monuments on, on Monument Row in Richmond 
uh, Virginia were removed. And so there's, there's reason to believe that maybe all along uh, people were just look, waiting for uh, creative intervention so that people could begin to reimagine how this public space can and should be used. Um, I, I, I wanted to shout out to Carrie May, um, something that um, that has dictated, has changed changed my life. Every conversation with Carrie, especially when she's mad, those are the best conversations with Carrie because she just tells you like it is. Um, and she really talked to us about within our, our collaboration for Freedoms, which she was was uh, has been kind of working with us on for I don't know how long, Carrie May, but which uh, that we need to really think about um, where play falls into our work. You know, she said to us earlier this year that there's a lot of room for seriousness in play, but not a lot of room for play and seriousness. And she's helped us to recognize through our work that many of us are playing an infinite game, which is connects to the ancestral wisdom, and ancestral intelligence. And we're going from 1860 to infinity uh, in this liberation emancipation march. And uh, I hope those who are watching might co go to Four Freedoms and download the Infinite Playbook, inspired by um, a studio visit with Carrie May, where uh, we decided to come up with the rules of the infinite game. And these rules are, are how we can invite everyone into the field of play and civic participation. And we, the goal is to channel civic joy and civic creativity into civic affirmative action. Thanks very much, Hank. Um, you've um, you've teed up Carrie very nicely there. So um, maybe we should uh, move on and uh, speak to Carrie May Weems. And you provided us with some images that you wanted to um, talk through a little bit that relate to your work that centers on this question of the monument. Well, I mean, well, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. And of course, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be here. And, you know, uh, I, I do have to say this uh, uh, to Magda, uh, who I've known for so many years. I think I met Magdalena, um, you, know, uh, you know, two weeks after she came to the United States. We met, we met in Boston. I went to see her exhibition and we've been friends ever since. And uh, of course, Hank, I've known since before he was born. Uh, his mother is my sister, my best friend, and, um, and so it's really kind of wonderful to be in conversation with them this morning, not simply because they are my friends and because I love them, because they do what they do. And the thing that's very interesting to me, you know, is that, you know, that, it, that, it, that, it, that it's only artists that actually do this kind of work in the way that we actually do it, which really sort of interests me in a, in a very particular way, right? You know, uh, traditional academics would take, you know, several years, you know, just to organize like this one platform. Um, whereas uh, Magda, you know, with her energy, her insight, her extraordinary level of, of conviction, of compassion, of love, of charity, of race, um, and this determination to move the needle um, is always considering, always thoughtful, always passionate, and always trying to figure out quickly how to move and how to do it in our lifetime, right? And Hank is doing the same thing. And I'm so um, honored to be a part of their world. I'm so honored to be able to call them friends. Uh, and they are such important, important artists. I've been working, of course, with monuments for many, many years in many different ways. I love monuments. I love looking at them. I love thinking about them. I like using them as sites of contemplation, you know, of recrimination, of questioning and my sort of curiosity. I photographed them. I've been standing in front of them for years and looking at them. I've been photographing like the empty plaques that have been left by those statues that have been removed, which I think we should also come back to because I have real questions about what should be moved and what shouldn't be moved and why. 
right? How shall I be moved, <laughs> right? You know, I think of them as sort of sites of transformation. I've, I've performed inside monuments, for instance, a Holocaust uh, monument in Berlin, right? I've used, you know, myself to sort of sit in contemplation of them, to think about them as sort of dislocations of memory and sort of firmness of memory, historical memory, and the necessity of thinking about monuments to the future, you know, like Tatlin's Monument to the Third International. I have loved since I was 16 years old. I have drawn and photographed and thought about and copied forever. In fact, my husband just gave me a copy of it for, um, for, for Christmas, right? So that I could, I could live with it more. And so I find them, you know, very, very important. And of course, you know, relational, relational. What is, a, what is our relationship to monument and what is the monument of context? How does it need to be challenged? And sort of the words of, you know, Hank, which I really love, you know, how do we challenge and then alter? And what does it mean to sort of challenge and, and, and to alter um, contemporarily? And I would imagine that, you know, when I talk about the sort of, the sort of relational um, play of monument, and you can scroll through the slides as, as I speak, you don't have to wait for me. Um, you know, that as we sort of think about this, and we're also sort of thinking about kind of the, the, the dismantling of the, of the colonial enterprise. And yet, even as we sort of struggle for sort of notions of, of justice, of notions of equity, and I'm using equity as opposed to inequality, right? As notions of, of equity. You know, we are nonetheless a pluralistic society. So then who decides what's important? How do we feed and nourish, and nourish those very different and altering and um, uh, uh, tensions that are forever at play. So, so I've been thinking about them in a lot of different ways for a very long time. Uh, I started photographing them. Uh, I photographed it at Gettysburg. I photographed across Europe. I photographed it in DC. Um, of course, you know, during the removals, I began to immediately photograph. So it's a, it's a very interesting sort of question for me. Um, while I'm in love with Kahinde's work, I think it's so, so important. Karen Oliver's work, which, which um, was just a wonderful question about the future of monument, what, what a monument might look like in the future, um, has been exciting, an exciting proposition of consideration, sort of forward thinking and thought, monuments to the future, so to speak. Um, but it is nonetheless contested territory. And how do we negotiate these contested territories that ultimately have to be addressed? And so, so therein, I think, really sort of lies the rub that even though we, again, are seeking sort of change, we're seeking change within a system that really hasn't historically changed very much. I mean, you live within a capitalist enterprise, right? <laughs> right? You know, how, do we, how do we square that with notions of a progressive future, for instance. Um, a lot of the material that's coming out right now, I'm really not a fan of. I think it's really awful material. I think they're really, you know, they lack imagination. They're not particularly interesting. In a sort of rush of reckoning, you know, a lot of material is going up that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. Right? So that doesn't really sort of satisfy my own sort of aesthetic question, you know, or the problems about sort of representation. You know, and so perhaps the other question is, is, you know, what, what, what is the sort of changing nature and role of representation that has to be considered in the building of monuments to the future? So, so it's, a, it's a very dynamic question. I think I'm probably like the worst person in the world to be on this panel. Um, because I can think of a whole group of other people that I think would be much more interesting. And then, of course, you know, there's all the work that's being done around monuments, all the books that are being, being written about monuments.
documents, the essays that are being published, the articles. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very dynamic, you know, extraordinary field. And I'm very interested to know, Kevin, from your vantage point, you know, um, how do you we begin to sort of posit notions of future building, you know, and is the monument the thing that's really um, at play? Or is it something else that needs to be considered? Right? I love rocks, personally. I think that they work really well. Uh, well, I want to begin by taking exception to your statement that you're the least um, <clears throat> important speaker on this topic, because I think you've already opened up a bunch of different questions that are all really fascinating. And I wrote down a few things I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about. Um, you know, the, the changing nature of representation is, of course, central, right? And, and has been since the 18th century when, um, you know, the um, you know, new Americans toppled statues in lower Manhattan and elsewhere of, you know, British colonial figures. So this kind of revision in material forms of history has been going on for a couple hundred years. But that said, I mean, this is a very specific moment, as you bring out. And, you know, this moment of dismantling, which is a word that you used, I think, very leadingly, is um, an important one to lead on. And I love that um, great, that sentence you said, um, I hope I have it right, how should I be moved, right? So there's, which to me embodies both the idea of like, you know, how do we move these monuments? And you've showed us the empty plinths, right, where they used to stand, right? Where, how and where do we move them to if, we, if we're rethinking the history that they represent? And on the other hand, and here again is where artists are much better than academics in doing this. How, do, how, do, how should I be moved emotionally about this content, right? How should I be What's the best way to be moved um, to really consider what history adheres in the buildings and monuments that surround us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you are, um, you are uh, in Virginia, right? I mean, you're surrounded by Jefferson's, by Jefferson's quad, aren't you? Right? Well, well, I'm in Tennessee, but I came from Virginia. Right, so, right, yeah. right, you know? And so, I mean, just that very idea of where we are placed. You know, it's difficult. I mean, I think, I, I think that one of the things that we are, we, we, we are up against, we're pressed by, is that, is that the, 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 context, the context for memory hasn't changed because the architecture for because a new architecture hasn't been formed that allows for another kind of relational relational or relationship to the architecture right i mean right this i mean architectural space determines actually what is situated within the architecture and what is related to the architecture so we are living in a space where that has been built by, you know, the master of the house, right? His universities, his, his monuments to himself, right? He has erected monuments, men have erected monuments to themselves, monuments to their exploits, monuments to their achievements, monuments to their capital, monuments to their power. And every place we look, we are dealing with that. Very rarely are we dealing with anybody else's space, right? Right? We can start to talk about who built those spaces, <laughs> but right? But we're really dealing with, 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 I think, this very, very um, important idea. Um, and so within that context, um, what then, how do we begin to really negotiate and think and uh, think about the future of play um, in an architectural space that has maybe been built by your forefathers, but
but that you very, but, but, but that has very little to do with you in terms of, of the public imagination. Right. I think it's really a dynamic question. You know, and I've sort of like looked at these ideas around sort of architecture, not only in relationship to your sort of, you know, masculine power, right? Um, but also in relationship, you know, to, you know, to the female body, right? Which is also rarely uh, represented in architectural form. One might see it in other societies. You know, you might see, you see it, for instance, in the, uh, the images and the photograph, architectural photographs that I made in, in various parts of West Africa, where the female form, where architecture is actually laid out in relationship to the gender that occupies that space. Like a very clear uh, sense of representation in relationship to the building of a site itself and the way in which the building will be used and therefore who will occupy the space. I mean, I find these, you know, ideas really sort of extraordinary, but we don't really deal with that so much here within, um, within our Western uh, male-centric uh, culture. Right. I think, I mean, you bring up such fascinating ideas and one, one word that you come back to is occupation. And of course, we think back 10 years or whatever to the Occupy movement, right? Which was about taking those spaces made by men, which you described, right? And occupying them for different purposes. And today, of course, the occupation of space is so charged because of COVID, because of, you know, the, um, <clears throat> you know, political, climate around being in public and that that's such an important theme and that play between all the kind of informal occupations of space and the very deliberate purposeful often repressive occupations of space that pre-exist so thank you very much i i, I don't want to cut you off but i don't also want to shortchange uh, monica who will turn to now and ask her about the intersections of some of these ideas with her own practice. Thank you so much. Uh, I am incredibly honored to be here amongst such illustrious company, a little bit starstruck. Um, I've been listening to Carrie May's um, comment about the lack of representation of women in, uh, in our sense of the monument. So I thought to continue that line of thinking um, by introducing uh, an extraordinary project that forever transformed the um, institution that I run, which is the Apple, and I will share my screen in order to, uh, can everybody see, um, mm -hmm. guess who's coming to dinner too, Patricia Carsonhout. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, this is a, uh, an artist that I thought would be a uh, guest to this table um, that Marina and uh, Magda have, um, organized with love and to uh, sustain our breath and our spirit. Um, this is an artist that I thought would be an incredible guest to the table. Um, so I will just speak and focus on her work, which is called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner Too, and which she also calls a collective monument. Um, it is a table that uh, you see uh, behind her um, installed in the aula of the apple, um, which is a space that we only began to occupy um, with this installation. And um, it honors 38 uh, black women of, and women of color in particular who have transformed history. Um, unfortunately, those women's histories are buried and for many of them, we do not have an image and we do not really have archives. So um, taking inspiration from Sadia Hartman's 
uh, notions of a kind of speculative archive. Um, Patricia organized a team of researchers and um, opened her ears to oral histories of uh, women that she felt needed to be named and um, honored and, uh, and given a place at the table. Um, of course, the, the shape of this table, the triangular shape of this table is already a kind of um, feminine uh, icon that Judy Chicago used for her um, dinner table, a very famous feminist work that's installed permanently at the Brooklyn uh, Museum as a kind of monument. Um, and as much as Patricia felt this was an important precedent, she also noted the lack of uh, women of color at that table and wanted to um, both continue and in some ways depart from that history and that um, forms. So the dinner settings that she devised, um, which are glass blown um, in uh, Amsterdam based on uh, vessels uh, from Latin America, uh, pre-Columbian vessels that were used for dining with the dead. So very much vessels to invoke uh, these women um, and their spirits uh, are not individual plates, but actually collective dining uh, settings. And that formally was an incredibly important um, innovation. Uh, here you see the table from another angle with our aula windows adorned with adinkra symbols rooted in Ghana. Um, in lieu, um, here you see the vessels a little bit more closely and the corner vessels are grounded on uh, beds of earth, um, which were spiritually very important to bring into this space. And I'm sitting in the space right now it is blessed uh, by Patricia. And I think our institution continues to feel it. Um, I promised Patricia that um, I would transmit a couple of messages about this work that really could be discussed for uh, many hours and was lived in uh, incredible ways for the temporary time it was here, but I'm happy to say that it is being collected by four institutions in the Netherlands. So a kind of collective of institutions has been uh, constituted to keep this uh, monument alive. And um, they will add names to the table with Patricia's uh, guidance and continue to gather uh, people to embroider. Um, there are stitchins that are organized with local women. Um, she did one also in uh, Senegal with expert um, embroiderers there. And um, the process involves many, many people. And I hope you will have a chance to really dig a little bit deeper into this um, incredible work. But I did promise to Patricia to uh, relay that um, what you see materially is not necessarily the monument. The monument is the living uh, remembrance of these women's lives and the enunciation of their names. Um, and I also promised that I would read the biography of at least one of these heroines of resistance, as um, Patricia also calls them. So if I have enough time, Kevin, may I read from a, from a publication that remains, which um, is a, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and show you the publication. This is a publication done by a very young uh, designer called um, Lydian Alberto, and it moves in two directions, from back to front, 
in Dutch from front to back in English, somehow um, acknowledging that progress also moves in two directions, that it requires deep historical research and study. So Kevin, may I read one biography from this book? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, Janie Tatari. Um, each person is introduced with an Adinkra symbol. And I will just show you Janie Tatari's, uh, chosen by Patricia. Um, this one is uh, standing for fortitude and preparedness. Um, and here it goes. Uh, Janie Begum Tatari, indentured rebel of Suriname. Uh, Janie Tatari, 1856 to 1884, was born in India under British colonial rule where she became divorced already at a young age. The life for single divorced women was tough and the beautiful stories of Indian work recruiters who promised a well-paid job overseas were very appealing to her and she decided to enroll. She arrived in Suriname in 1880 with her 10 year old son where she was contracted by the plantation Zorgen Hop and became an indentured worker, effectively working in conditions of enslavement. Here, Tatari got her nickname Begum, meaning noble woman, as she was committed to improving the conditions of the other contract workers and defended women who were treated badly by their husbands. In 1884, conditions ex escalated and the contract workers were forced to do heavy labor at a very low payment. If the work was not completed, no reward was paid. Reportedly, that very same day, Janie's work group, along with some male combatants, injured a white officer with sticks. In order to repress the uprising, the colonial government sent soldiers to arrest the contract workers who were involved in the assault. However, the workers revolted and formed a strong union, spreading out in different groups and armed themselves with sticks and cut cutlasses. Led by Janie, the female workers fought along with the men. Janie challenged the soldiers who failed to break the uprising at their first attempt. A sniper mission was then ordered to eliminate the leader of the female rebels. The gunshot wound which killed Janie was also the trigger that ended this resistance. On 27th September 1884, Janie Begum Tatari was buried together with the other victims of the uprising on the plantation Zorg in Hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, given that we're running a little bit short on time, we're going to um, skip the break that we were going to take at this point and move directly to um, Ben Davis's response. <clears throat> okay. Can, well, we can't see you, so um, feel free to take a break while I'm talking, because um, I am the least important person here, of course. Uh, not being an artist or a curator, I don't have um, a um, project to show you, but I am simply here to maybe um, pull out some common themes from the presentations to lead us into a conversation as the respondent. and. Um, it's a little intimidating to do that because I think that there's been so many um, uh, rich themes about about monuments that have been brought up. But I, I did the, the the idea from Hank's um, um, uh, presentation about the idea of the field of play, and Carrie talking about the the relational and pluralism and um, some of the aesthetic questions of monuments, and Monica talking about the speculative archive. I think really brings together some thoughts that I've been having about um, about the new monument movement because that's really we are in the middle of, of that's why we're here because there is a little bit of a new monument movement among artists that's coming out of the protests right now the artists are trying to participate um, actively in those conversations and there is a, a, a new wave of monuments some of varying qualities and characteristics as Carrie mentioned um, that that we can debate. There's a very good article um, that inspired me from the Los Angeles Times by Carolina Miranda called Goodbye Man on Horse, 
which is about the, uh, the, the new monument movement, where she was talking about a lot of the new proposals for monuments that are coming out. And, and how, you know, there is, we're, there is this very traditional kind of monument that you could designate with this style man on horse. That is the patriarchal authority figure standing on the horse. And reading that article and listening to you um, folks, it really strikes to me that in the new monument discussion, there are three different characteristics that the kind of monuments people are coming up with now are, are, are doing something different than monuments have done historically. And the first one has to do, I think, with the subject matter of the monuments, that when we talk about the man on horse style of monument, the, 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 the bronze figures of great men, um, that comes out of the, the 19th century conversation, um, there was a kind of history that people learned for the longest time was called the great man idea of history. It's actually a theory of history, that history is driven by great heroic individuals. And the monuments um, that dot our city streets sort of put that theory of history into bronze and into stone and at the center of our um, urban environments. And really the new forms of monuments that, that all of our panelists have talked about don't do that, right? I mean, we're not, the kind of history that people learn today, and it's one of my theories about why monuments have become such a target for protest, is not just because of what they represent, because of how they represent it. That people are not comfortable anymore with the idea of the great man theory of history, but people are, uh, 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 progressive people, radical people, um, people coming to consciousness now are taught as a people's history. The idea that history, what drives history is movements and, and groups of people working together. So, and this, you even see this in Hanks um, talking about the wide awakes. Well, so the wide awakes are a movement who helped elect Lincoln. So there's a different way of thinking about history that we're orienting on groups and crowds masses of people rather than the single hero that came out of that because as we know even even people are now even um, questioning the the statues of lincoln for, for various reasons that we can talk about so i think that there's a different way of thinking about or of what monuments are about like and most of the new monuments there have been attempts to honor individual people you know to to find a hero or heroine that is equal to the figures um the historical figures that have been historically uh, memorized, like the, the monuments to the suffragettes that went up in uh, controversial monuments to the suff suffragist movement that went up in New York recently. But most of the new monuments are about more abstract things. I mean, I think that's a very striking feature of them and of most of the things that have been talked about, that they're more speculative, more, um, they're more about movements, more about uh, moments, more about tragedies. Uh, more about surfacing history that has been suppressed, really people, monuments that represent a people's history. The second thing um, that you guys didn't talk so much about, but I just want to open it as a discussion, is I think there's another, mirroring that, there's an idea of authorship, that the great man theory of history was always matched by the idea of the solo artist, that you commissioned a single genius who came in and gave their spin or particular um, um, stamp on urban space. And I know that you are probably being tapped all the time for to do individual monuments, but it seems to me a lot of the new monuments are much more communal. They involve like tons of communal feedback, trying to um, figure out what the community needs, what's gonna, what's gonna uh, be needed and so on. And this changes the way people think about authorship in, in an interesting way that, that reflects the kind of new history that people are telling. And I, I wonder how that, um, relates to, to any of these conversations you've been having. And then the third and last uh, uh, thing that I see in the new monument conversation is, um, you know, people talk about writing history from above or history from below, you know, the great man theory of history or the people's history. And these monuments like are very physical representation of history from above, right? Like it's a single great person staring down at you. It's Columbus or Jefferson or, or, um, or Jefferson Davis or, or Robert E. Lee staring down at you. And the, it really strikes me that most of, a lot of the new conversation, and this relates to the idea of, um, the, of space that Carrie was talking about, have to, the, the, a lot of the new monument activity is, is about building spaces, you know, plazas, 
gardens, um, or even more experimental forms of, of conversational um, actions that, that really um, provide plazas and venues um, for people to participate in. So I'm thinking about UVA's Memorial to Enslaved Laborers that, um, you know, it is essentially a, a designed as a garden, uh, a gathering space for, um, for, uh, for, 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 memor for memory, but also for various forms of actions on the school campus and the Sleepy Lagoon monument that's, that um, Carolina Miranda talks about, that's a monument to a, a racist, um, a racist uh, series of, 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 of murders in, um, in Los Angeles that, that's thought about in a very similar way, like a garden that brings people together. So those, I think those are the place to start a conversation about like, like not just the need to, to like what is changing about the contemporary monument. And then I have a final question that just carries questions about the quality of these monuments brought up for me. And so I'm gonna throw it out there um, as, as the respondent, which is like, is this an aesthetic question? As in like, these are artists talking about this, but monuments have not historically been like the most aesthetically, uh, this the aesthetic form of sculpture. I mean, actually, you know, as people continuously say, it's very true. Confederate memorials, Confederate memorials were not, they're not, one of the reasons, you know, there are many reasons to get rid of them because of what they represent, but anyone who says a reason to keep them is because they're great works of art is, he doesn't know what they're talking about in general, because most of these monuments were, um, were cheap uh, clones that were, uh, pumped out in order to make a specific kind of civic statement, um, a specific to terrorize a certain kind of people, to provide a certain kind of point of identification for the white population. So is this an aesthetic conversation? Is that the right way to think about it? Because historically, a lot of, uh, uh, that's not, that, that, you know, a lot of monuments are political statements masked as artistic statements. And so I've written a little bit about the Columbus Monument, for instance, where it's a kind of, the figure of Columbus is really a historic compromise where the monuments are always- But there are many, many different kinds of monuments at play. Yes. You know, yes. There, are, there are many different kinds of monuments at play. I, I mean, I think aesthetics are always important. I'm an artist, right? You know, so how you occupy space is something that I'm always considering, right? And I, and I, and I think a lot about how something needs to look in order to not only engage my public, but to engage me, right? You know, so, so I think that, I, I do think that it's really important. And I do want to say this, I do want to say this, that, that um, we haven't mentioned. Um, it was really, as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong, you architectural historians may correct me, um, but it was really Maya Lin, who really introduces us to new forms of thinking about non-representational monument, right? It was a woman and who has completely changed, really, the in part, the debate around monument. And yet, and yet, you know, we haven't mentioned her. And so I think it's really important actually to sort of bring her up within this, within this context, because I think she's been so important and um, it has fed a whole movement of how to build monument going forward contemporarily that is non-representational and that idea going back to um, uh, professor murphy's notion right you know you know what is the relationship of you know of the representational to the notion of monument class and citizenship right and does it simply need to be abandoned in part right, as a way of renegotiating a future, right? Because language then starts to function as the, as the, as the, as the monument, right? The word itself begins to function and play for us, I think, in a really critical way that, um, that no man on horse um, will ever do for us, right? And it also um, slices across um, sort of these sort of notions about who was represented and why, right? It's sort of, you know, that she didn't have to deal with any of those issues. Um, she just listed the names mm -hmm. of the everyday. I mean, it was a really a brilliant piece. Yeah, I mean, she did that when she was a student. Wait, can, I, can, I, can I jump in and just thank Ben? And I also want to 
rapid, <laughs> no, don't apologize, a couple of questions from our audience that I think connect to this idea of reinvention that I totally agree with you, myelin is essential to that uh, phenomenon, Carrie. And I want to I want to ask on behalf of two Vanderbilt students, um, Tina Peterson and Chloe Davis, um, in this reinvention, a is there is there a way of um, making room for the oral for sound, and b what is the what might be the impact of the digital in this remaking kind of reinvention now of um, of the monument. Well, you know, um, just, to, just to jump in very quickly, um, one of the great monuments that uses sound is uh, one of the Martin Luther King monuments that was developed by, um, by this wonderful, um, uh, I can't think of his name, I'm so sorry, a wonderful artist who passed away a few years ago, but the monument is in San Francisco, um, uh, the King Monument. And he uses snippets of sound, of both of water, of King speaking, and I think music as well. So, so there are there are things like that um, that are at play, for instance, that I that that, that uh, that's, that's real and that absolutely intrigued me when I saw it the first time, you know, 15 years ago. Well, uh, Kevin, you or uh, mentioned Monticello, and I, I I have been to Monticello recently, actually, and. Um, uh, you can really see how they're attempting to reckon, you know, they're, they're trying to incorporate um, the, yes. the, the, the history of, of, of his, um, well, his, what, what we call his crimes now into it. And that does involve basically counter tours, you know, and, and I actually find it very, very moving and informative just to, 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 which is a form of incorporating the oral, you know, is to like, this is a monument I don't think is going away. And, and they are incorporating the stories of, of not just the slaves as a group, but individual people who, enslaved people who, who, who worked at Monticello. Um, I don't know if it's totally there yet, but it's definitely, that's, I think the oral has to come in as one way to reckon with things that aren't quite what. Look, that's you right. And the, and the monument to the enslaved workers at EVA does the same thing. And I think this connects to a couple of questions that have been asked already about sort of the place of these more um, critical and uh, monuments that really counter the narrative, the main narrative, right? Um, so the Confederate monuments were erected by the same kind of people who were in charge of everything, right? Who made the landscape, who controlled resources, et cetera. So well, a lot of them were a lot of them actually sort of, you know, made and presented by the daughters of the uh, Confederacy. Right, the UDC. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think maybe we might have to <laughs> recognize the, the role of women yet again. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You but they, but in any case, they're of the class, right, and the race of the people who were in charge. And then also, you know, sort of this sort of, you know, championing of a certain kind of nationalism. Right, and siding with a certain kind of nationalism, siding with a certain kind of patriarchy. I think that this sort of goes back to I think some of what Ben was sort of getting at that I think is really important, and therefore really calls up again sort of the, the relational question of monument to the groups that propose them and present them. Right, that the monument then serves as a representation of your own deep political and moral values. Um, and th the only question that I, that, that I have really for the, for, for the group, um, Kevin and, and Ben, if you don't mind speaking to this and hey, um, you know, given, given, given that we're sort of talking about this notion of the precarious South, the monument in the South, the look and agency, the agency in that terrain, right? Um, how do you start to think about monument and do you think about monument differently in this very particular contested territory? This is the first time I've been in the South in a very long time, actually. I mean, it's very interesting. Um, for the most part, none of my work, with the exception of Nashville and, and maybe Atlanta, it's the first time I've ever shown in the South. Right? I'm not, you know, I have not been wanted there. 
<laughs> anyway, to the question. Anybody like to speak to the South? Right, the, the, you know, this precarious, the precarious South and monument in relationship to that place in particular. Do we think about it differently in New York or in Washington, DC than we do in Mississippi or in Nashville or in Tennessee? Or could should we, we? Could we jump in here, even when we are not part of the panel, could I just add something here? Or, they, or David, you want to answer that? I just want to mention two things important that I hear from Carrie, um, everybody, Monica, and I want to think for you guys, the panelists, to think about the materiality of the monument. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and I think, Carrie, that in this question in the, in the South, if in the South, if in the context and this planetary South that we are thinking about, the condition of the language and the materiality of the monument may have shifted, even historically, because I don't think the man in horse is something that we found in Africa, for instance, in the way that we, fa we, we found in the uh, uh, imitative mood of the American new democracy from the European mode, which mm -hmm. is patriarchal caramel. So I would think what are the other materiality of the monument? And I retrieve in that. Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead then. I'll follow up. No, 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 hang on, go please. I've already spoken. I, I know, but what you're going to say is going to make me sound smarter. So hey, go ahead. Build off hey. ben, ben, ben has great ideas I like to build off of. Please. Oh, I just wanted to say uh, uh, really quick in the, in the, in the, um, the, the, um, that article I mentioned, the Dubai Man on Horse, in terms of materiality, um, they talk a lot about the um, the altar as as an alternate um, thing way to think about these these uh, the idea of a monument, particularly the kind of street side altars you see in um, in uh, Latino communities in, in in Los Angeles, where people contribute and gather around. Um, a, a place of memorial and add and add their own things. That's all I was going to say because I think that is. I, I do have larger questions about materiality because it seems to me that um, monuments are always about a statement about the past, but it's also about what the present. And our present is very mercurial and dynamic. So I do wonder if we're moving towards more liquid uh, forms of monument, temporary forms of monument, just because. Um, you know, th things are changing. On, on the, on the uh, theme of liquidity, can we pivot to Monica and then Hank very quickly? And then I'd like to have um, uh, Magda introduce this uh, video of Carrie Mae Wynn's intervention. So Monica. I think Hank didn't get to speak, so I'm always conscious I'll, I'll, of... Yeah, uh, so he's I'll next. After Carrie Mae. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, liquidity, I don't know if I can no, no, immediately... Hmm? It, do, it doesn't have to be about liquidity. I just was in a liquid way moving to talk to you. Yeah, I think um, I will bring in, a, I will sort of invoke another uh, Dutch example. Also a writer here from Maroon Surinamese background, Vincent van Velsen, who's recently written a text on the body as a monument, invoking this idea that mm. each time a person dies, a library is burned. Um, and that we each kind of are, in a certain sense, monuments of various histories. Uh, I just wanted to bring that quickly to the table, and I think there's lots of people. Uh, Thank saying you. much. That, that's a wonderful contribution, a nice bridge to what we'll talk about next time. And finally, Hank, you're now in a sculpture park having landed your jet. Oh, no. You're muted. Of course, I, I, I will carry your May spoke. I remember that I actually have a sculpture that's in Nashville, Tennessee on the site of a former Confederate uh, uh, monument and Fort Bluff, Bluff Park um, and in Memphis, Tennessee, I'm sorry. 
um, right by the river. And it is a, a different kind of monument to the monument in the form of a speech bubble that's empty that when you sit inside of it, you become the statement. And it's uh, made in tribute to uh, the, the grandmothers of two of my collaborators, Will Sylvester and, and uh, Helen Bannock. But also uh, when we think about that in different places like uh, the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, where I also, um, it's funny, I, I, it's a monument, but I really think about my work as part of uh, of, of uh, the greater Equal Justice Initiative agenda. So it doesn't necessarily feel like it's my particular sculpture, but it is a, a, a 25 foot sculpture um, monumentalizing a uh, photograph by Ernest Cole of my Ernest being strip searched in South Africa, but also trying to connect uh, with the historical struggle, global struggle for equal and human rights um, around the world. And, I think when we think about uh, the material, uh, you know, the stainless steel or the bronze, uh, but what, what Monica said most importantly is that um, we all have the potential to be the monuments. And part of what I think we should be really reflecting upon when we look about AI, I learned, Maria, is uh, ancestral intelligence, um, this, this, this deeper knowledge. Um, how do we, uh, er, all the things that we're making are messages to, the, to our children and to the future. So uh, what we say and do and what artifacts live uh, from beyond this moment uh, are actually far, uh, I mean, those, those are the important, most important things we can do. So most of what we know about past societies is through their art, whether it, whether it be through the, 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 the pottery or the, the monuments and so I think if we start to operate with that awareness we'll um, begin to elevate the whole conversation. That, that's a beautiful place to bring our conversation to uh, Carrie May's interventions and I just emphasize what Hank has told us which is be the monument. So let's all try to do that. Magda. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I, uh, with this um, inter intervention that we're going to pray of Karim May, we will call an end of our session. Uh, I, I, because I really believe and I engage with the future and because we need to be a better future some way, somehow. Uh, and into that better future, new monuments need to be created. I really thank you, every one of you, for being here. This is EADJ is a little bit of a, a small monument that we are starting to build at Vanderbilt. And I don't going to introduce the intervention. I, am, I just shift my mind and I'm going to let Marina Fokiris, the program curator, to introduce the intervention. So I love you all. Remember, love is the only ideology worth fighting for. Thank you, Magda. It was so wonderful meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Magda. I mean, um, as this intervention, we have Carrie Mary Wings. I will, I will ask her to speak about the COVID project herself. I just want to say that the idea why we had these interventions was because we are practically meeting on the cloud. And we thought very much so in the very beginning of uh, this um, endeavor, how we can somehow throw in the locality, the, ma the, materia the material locality into the place, the kind of locational trade. And we thought that it will be great if we invite three or four interventions that will happen on the ground, will be registered and will be broadcasted even on the cloud where we meet because this conversation is broadcasted from or thought from Nashville, Tennessee is very well Carrie Mae Wims uh, brought before and this is always to be reminded. So Carrie, tell us two things about the, or three things about the COVID project that now is up the walls of different buildings Thank in you. Nashville. You know, it's, it's, it's really um, a project uh, that I developed along with uh, uh, my closest friend, uh, Pierre Loving to um, really think about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on Black, Brown, and Native people uh, across the country. That we knew, based on inequity uh, and the way in which um, we are all impacted, uh, that, um, that, this, that they would be the most impacted by COVID-19, that workers would be the most impacted, 
that black, black and brown would be the most impacted because they are often the frontline workers, the nannies and the nurses, right? Um, the shopkeepers, right? the delivery people, the barbers and the butchers. I mean, right? so, so we really knew that this was going to um, be uh, a problem. And so I immediately started work on uh, a COVID-19 project that's an artist-driven public awareness campaign. And it is um, uh, not a, a monument in any traditional sense but it is um, a public art space, a public work that is, uh, Hank said that uh, public spaces are spaces that we need to, to both challenge and alter. It is the place where we meet uh, really historically in, in our lives. And this just gives you a very simple uh, look at some of the work that is a part of uh, the COVID-19 project. I want to again thank uh, Magdalena for um, uh, the effort and the extraordinary amount of energy that it takes to, uh, to do not only this conference, but also to bring this project to, uh, to Nashville and to Vanderbilt University uh, as well. And to also to, to, to Katie Dalmez, who uh, has been working closely to with the group uh, in order to bring the work there. So um, I'll let um, you uh, share it and, uh, and then we'll sign up. Essential workers are the heroes of this entire, this entire tragedy that we're experiencing, really. I mean, you know, society would collapse without it, without these people and without what they're willing to provide. When I hit a sign, I think it'll give me hope that, you know, like one day that we will like hold hands again and, you know, I mean, like we'll have a new like normal, like obviously, but, uh, it gives me hope on the future, yeah. Super uh, excited and honored to, to be able to participate in this project and have the banners by Kerry Mae Weems here. Uh, this building is the chemistry building or the science building, named after St. Elmo Brady. Uh, and Thomas Talley. St. El Saint Elmo Brady was the first African American to receive a PhD in chemistry. And so in thinking about our students, in thinking about our students with them being two-thirds having aspirations of being uh, either a dentist or a doctor or a medical doctor, uh, we felt that this was the best place to say thank you, especially because it's also adjacent to Meharry Medical College where many of our students go to. volunteered at the COVID testing site for a bit of time right wow. before um, starting medical school and so just seeing stuff like this or when people come by and honk or you just can see something that makes you feel kind of connected to other people in um, ways that we weren't before. You yeah. know a lot of the physical touch is gone but I think a lot of the kind of spiritual and emotional and mental connections have to you know lift up from this and so yeah. just seeing stuff like this kind of creates um, unity and I don't know, um, hope actually between volunteers and all of the first line workers and all of the essential workers and so seeing things like this just makes you feel really good you know and it kind of just lets the community know as well like you're not forgotten yeah and we're yeah. here yeah and no we completely and we yeah. see you yeah yeah not one of those towns like New York or LA that was dealing with the pandemic on such a huge level as everyone else, yeah. but as a mid-south, mid-scale type of town that really, uh, we are thrive, the city thrives on connection, yeah. and it, it runs on the support of the frontline workers. So this, this piece of mural, uh, it speaks directly to the heart of the town. We're so grateful to have it here. So thankful for uh, Ms. Carrie McWeems adding this work to her long, long <laughs> catalog of amazing work.
gonna teach you about you know social distancing, you know, stay, you know, stay you know, six feet, you know. Terrific. Oh my God. <laughs> what a wonderful use of all the material. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, great. All right. Very welcome. So we see everybody the serie. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Next Wednesday. <laughs>